Murph here, and today we're talking crypto and investing 101. It's a series we've been doing on YouTube. Uh, jump into the playlist, learn all sorts of things about cryptocurrency and investing. This is meant to be the starter, like a starting point for people that are brand new to cryptocurrency or investing, or maybe you just want to learn more about cryptocurrency. Um, in, in investing generally uh, and so this is a course that I'm putting together it's not financial advice of course uh, made to be entertainment and, and educational um, but yeah you should be able to learn a lot from this and uh, a lot of this is you know I'm showing videos throughout this course but uh, so it's more of like a reaction to videos course but you can also I mean, the, all this information has been cross cross referenced so I've also cross referenced all this information with tons of different articles and whatnot before I select that video um, so just to let you know that uh, without you know not to ramble on too much I'm gonna jump into uh, meeting our, our guest today which is space return space blocka blocka doing good doing good just wanted to get it out the way uh, it's a big it's, week it's in uh, nerddom it might be me. It's me. It was me. Huh? Oh, no, it's good. Okay. So tomorrow you got the season one finale of Moon Knight. That's not a spoiler. Uh, Marvel tweeted out themselves that this is a season finale. So if you're mad, be mad. Uh, Friday, Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Universe. I'm not going to spoil everything, but there is an end credit where uh, Catwoman, Zoe Kravitz from Batman come to Dr. Strange with a paternity test and it's not his but it might be and then next Friday Kendrick Lamar, Mr. Morale and the Big Steppers, uh, it's been five years um, a lot's happened in those five years we've seen some people come in and out of the office we've seen some people I don't know but you know it's going to be a good day it's going to be a good couple weeks. It's going to be a good day. All right. Thank you for that. Yeah. Again, a uh, space return returns here. Other than being a DeFi DJ and a musician, it's an avid pop culture carnivore. Nerd. Uh, nerd. You know what I'm saying? It's like, you know, and that's what Money Match Gaming is all about. We're about promoting that nerd culture, um, helping people pursue their passions um, in, in whatever nerdy ways they see fit. You know, that's what we're about. We're about making that a thing. Uh, so, yeah. Thank you for sharing that with us today. Uh, we're going to jump into today's topics. The Federal are, Reserve. The cornerstone. <laughs> there, of, let, let me stop that. The Federal Reserve. Uh, for one, it's stocks and bonds. And so I had a tough time deciding whether we just can call this the Federal Reserve, stocks and bonds, or central banking. Because um, I should talk about a little bit of the, the IMF, uh, the Federal Reserve. And, like, you know, there's not just the Federal Reserve in the United States, but basically when that was created, what we call the Federal Reserve, uh, a few other branches were created, including the IMF. And I think that's when the SEC came around, too. But, like, a few other branches. And basically all these other countries that were involved also got their own versions of the Federal Reserve. So Britain got there, so the UK got there, et cetera. And, so there. And, and these are what people consider central banks when you hear the term central banking going around. It's because other than the JP Morgans and the, the key banks and whatever the heck else, there's the Federal Reserve and then there's whatever England's is called, you know. Uh, but these are the banks that pretty much control the world's monetary policy and this is voted on and whatnot. Um, and so we're going to be diving into that today and learning something about that whole side of thing. And let me pop this up on screen. Ba bow. There he is. In theater mode. Let's go. And now a brief lesson. Oh, I should also say, we like to listen to these things in 2x speed, folks. So uh, it's my secret sauce to getting through a lot of different videos in a day. Uh, so if you like to usually watch in 2x speed, I'd suggest maybe whenever we're watching the video itself, turning it down to 1.5, 1, you know, normal. Because uh, otherwise it's going to be 4x for you. Let's get it. on the Federal Reserve System. The Federal Reserve, or the Fed, is the central bank of the United States. As the central bank, it determines our nation's monetary policy. This means the Fed determines how much money is floating around in the U.S. economic ecosystem, ready to be spent on goods or services. By controlling the money supply, the Fed is able to influence both interest rates and the health of the overall economy. The Fed's goal is to keep two important economic metrics in check, unemployment and inflation. The Federal Reserve has a few tools to influence the economy, but its primary focus is the federal funds rate. This is the rate banks use when they lend to one another. Let's look at how this works. Banks are required to keep a certain amount of customer deposits on hand. This is called the reserve requirement, and is set by the Fed. If a bank is short one night, it'll call another bank and borrow money so it can meet the requirement. By influencing this interbank rate, the Fed also influences other short-term rates. Here's how it works. Banks profit by borrowing money at one rate and lending it out at a higher rate. 
Now suppose the Fed increases the federal funds rate. Banks don't want to borrow at a higher rate and then loan at a lower rate. This would cause banks to lose a lot of money. So when borrowing rates increase, a bank raises the rate it charges its customers. This is how an increase in the federal funds rate can cause a ripple effect throughout short-term rates. These changes in interest rates also impact the U.S. economy. For example, if the economy shows signs of slowing, the Federal Reserve will lower short-term rates in an attempt to turn things around. As a result of this, banks will decrease the rates for their customers. These low rates make it cheaper to borrow and less attractive to save. This leads to increased spending, borrowing, and investing. The Fed hopes these actions will lead to economic expansion. Changing an interest rate isn't as easy as turning a dial. To drive the federal funds rate toward its target, the Fed uses open market operations. This is where the Fed enters the bond market to buy and sell government securities. Doing this influences supply and demand, and thereby changes the federal funds rate. Historically, the Fed's open market operations only bought and sold short-term government securities, and therefore only influenced short-term interest rates. However, as a result of the Great Recession, the Fed has employed more unconventional monetary policy and has started purchasing longer-term securities. It did this to influence long-term interest rates. This process is known as quantitative easing, or QE. The Fed's actions can impact key economic measures like unemployment and inflation. For example, reducing long-term rates allows the Fed to help lower rates on mortgages or other types of loans. This could lead to things like people buying new homes or companies taking out loans to build a new factory or launch a new product line. These new commercial projects lead to companies hiring more people and thereby increase employment. However, when the economy grows too quickly or grows for a long period of time, it can cause inflation. Inflation is the rising cost of goods and services. To reduce inflation, the Fed increases rates, making it more expensive to borrow money. When it's too expensive to borrow money, businesses will reduce expansion and consumers will start to spend less. This decreased demand will cause prices to fall, lowering inflation. Now that you have an idea of how the Federal Reserve influences interest rates and the purposes of open market operations, you should be more comfortable when you're reading the highlights of the FOMC meeting when they're published. All right, and that's our first video. Quick and to the point, I wanted to choose a little bit of a faster one today. Um, so all that no knowledge to you. I know you've been, you know, doing your work with tax work and all this other stuff. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's it's a part of it. I've always been interested in how banks work because it's. I mean, that right there gave you a piece of it, but then there's also the home loans, the credit limits that they give. To these big companies but it's it, it's also interesting how the federal reserve can uh is manipulate the right word i think so <clears throat> yeah they like manipulate the because otherwise it would be like you know letting the market decide letting actual people you know in the you know, people's <laughs> supply and be letting supply and demand to decide really like in the market uh but instead of letting the market the you know decide they choose to hike up interest rates or lower interest or do whatever they want to do or print more money or buy into this is like what the bonds and stuff like that and why people were mad at congress over the course of the pandemic because they were like how is it that i'm not sure if you caught this but the people were like how is it the congress there was like 35 members of congress i believe or more somewhere around that number uh that outperformed hedge funds there was like three hedge funds two or three hedge funds that performed as well as these like other 35 members of Congress. They didn't even perform as well as these other 35 members of Congress did in, in stock trading and bond trading over the course of the pandemic. And like, that's kind of amazing because if you're in control of a hedge fund, you're being paid millions of dollars a year to get the best performing assets that you can get. If you're a member of Congress, you're maybe making around 100,000 a year or something like that or whatever to be doing your job and stuff like that as a, as a civil servant. It's not just going from over. that job, though. Yeah, yeah, just from that job. But like the fact that you would be able to somehow, while paying all this attention to your your servants, you know, the civilians and stuff like that, and all your, you know, reading all this paperwork and stuff like that, and you're somehow able to outperform hedge funds, which are being paid millions of dollars to keep every single finger on this stuff, kind of point, you know, it's like, how is that possible? And a lot of people, it's possible because of things like insider trading. Because if you're making the loss and dictating that to the Federal Reserve or whatever, um, or oh, maybe maybe we should have the you know <laughs> uh, influence the Federal Reserve to buy into these bonds or these stocks or whatever. Well, then you know first, and you can of course outperform a hedge fund. That if that hedge fund performs um, insider trading, they're going to jail. But if you're part of the rules making class and you just decide to do it, well, then, well, I had to make the rules. Of course, I bought in as early as possible. And it's like, mm. but that's also the reason why uh, so many members of banks in the United States and the Federal Reserve, like, step down and quit. They quit their jobs uh, because they are starting to be questioned about this insider trading stuff over the last year. And instead of taking all the stress and hassle from it, they just decided to quit their jobs of making yeah. millions of dollars a year. So that's that's something special uh, and yeah, these I think manipulations of their turn <laughs> these congress people they're like yes they make like a six figure job 
six figures salary representing the people but like don't let that fool you they are all millionaires yeah exactly if not billionaires from a long lineage like they got old they have old money see um yeah they have old money and well the funny thing is like a lot of the congressmen like while they are billionaires and like more often the people from the federal reserve are that much more wealthy than the just the typical con- Congress members because they did come up to the political reins and whatnot. But congressmen like uh, you know, specific to both sides, uh, there's Nancy Pelosi and yeah. uh, Mitch Millionaire. McConnell. Mitch McConnell, M- millionaires, see, but they only had so many millions before the pandemic started. Both of them, across like you know, couldn't do it across the entirety of their lifespan, right? But once the pandemic hit, they doubled their millions. They doubled their net worth in a two year span because all of a sudden there was a time of turmoil and we had to do all these these different things with but let's it's like yeah so you were 60 plus years old and you couldn't double your net any but all of a sudden you could double those millions of dollars in two years okay okay i'm you know, it's not asking more questions sure sure you just suddenly got really good at what you do or you cheated but whatever <laughs> My my opinions on that. Uh, our next video, and you can make your own opinions on this. Just pre- presenting some information about the Federal Reserve. This is my opinion. Undoing research about things. All those things are true, though. You can look that stuff up about Nancy Pelosi and Mitch McConnell. There's other people other than them. Um, and you, yeah, you can look up the stuff about the Federal Reserve and uh, different uh, presidents of of those uh, banks. And you know, stepping down. Um, all that is public information. So this next on oh, that last video was by T D Ameritrade. So that's who that first video was by. This video is by Business Casual on YouTube. Uh, and this is covering how the Federal Reserve works and who really owns it. So I think this is an important step to take because, you know, other than, you know, we, you know, you came up with the, the, the term, uh, you know, manipulation. And I agree with it. Uh, but who actually owns the Federal Reserve? Who, who how does it work, etc. And so this video is going to jump into that a bit for us and figuring out a little bit more about the Federal Reserve, how it works. Who, who technically owns it, if you want to say that anybody owns it. And um, yeah, without any, say anything else, let's, let's jump into this thing. The Federal Reserve, the cornerstone of the American economy. For just over a century, the Fed has overseen the financial system of the U.S., but its track record has been far from perfect. Worse yet, it has such a unique and convoluted structure that it's very difficult for people to really understand it, which is why, unsurprisingly, the Fed has been subject to various conspiracy theories, from being owned by the Rothschilds to being operated by lizard people. Today, we're going back to the dawn of American finance to see how the Fed was created, how it works, and who really owns it. This video is brought to you by Skillshare, where you can find a ton of different classes, including my own series of videos on how the stock market works. You can watch them for free by registering with the link in the description. America during the late 19th century was a nation in turmoil, and not just in the literal sense. The Civil War was no doubt devastating, but even during the peace that followed, America was plagued by frequent and deep economic depressions. The underlying cause was simple. America just lacked proper financial system, and more importantly, it didn't have a central bank to save the day when things turned bad. Now, keep in mind, central banking wasn't a new concept. The Dutch were the first to come up with a central bank in 1609, and it was instrumental in transforming the Netherlands from a swampy backwater into a global economic empire. Following the example of the Dutch, the English created the Bank of England in 1694, which of course became the backbone of the British Empire. But it's exactly this association with the British that made the founding fathers reluctant to use the same model in the United States. There were two attempts at establishing a central bank even despite public opposition. Alexander Hamilton himself led the first movement in 1791. But in both cases, the systems lasted under 20 years and did little to stabilize the situation. And by all accounts, the situation was very, very bad. Back then, even a single local bank failing could result in nationwide panics. People knew that no one could save their bank if it went bust. So as soon as rumors of insolvency started spreading, everyone frantically started withdrawing whatever they had, bankrupting otherwise healthy and... This is what they call a run on the bank. Whenever you hear somebody say it could be a run on the bank or recently in Russia, they experienced the run on the bank. This is what they're talking about. When people go to the bank to withdraw their, their money. If it went bust, so as soon as rumors of insolvency started spreading, everyone frantically started withdrawing whatever they had, bankrupting otherwise healthy insolvent banks simply out of fear. Such bank runs happened with frightening regularity, and the depressions that followed were long and painful. Of course, American bankers realized very well just how bad their industry was doing. Paul Warburg, one of the great American bankers of his day, said in 1907 that the American banking system then was at about the same point as 15th century Italy or Babylon in 2000 BC. Just a few months after Warburg made that statement, the country suffered the panic of 1907, and it was particularly severe. To start things off, in 1906, a devastating earthquake destroyed 80% of San Francisco. With reconstruction efforts underway, capital was very tight, and because all the money back then was in paper form, it was much more difficult to reallocate it across the country. One banker tried to abuse that by manipulating the stock price of the United Copper Company back on Wall Street. He hoped to see the shares rise exponentially in value, but instead they crashed dragging down the entire stock market with them. That banker was involved in 10 different banks across the East Coast, and one after another, these banks failed as people assumed they were insolvent and withdrew all their money. Pretty soon, even banks that had nothing to do with the guy were going under, and so the fearful bankers of America turned to the only man with the power to save them, J.P. Morgan. Back then, John Morgan was the king of Wall Street, and even today, the bank he created is the largest one in America. He wasn't the wealthiest man at the time, that title belonged to John Rockefeller, but Morgan was certainly the man everyone turned to when things got bad. In October 1907, Morgan summoned the great bankers of the day to his office at 23 Wall Street. With the collective capital of America's big banks, Morgan arranged for the rescue of the healthy banks that were nevertheless near bankruptcy. 
I'm gonna pause it right there. Already, you should start to see how some of the the pieces are falling into play in America for the, the things that we currently know. Why is Wall Street what it is? J.P. Morgan's office. Why is J.P. Morgan such a big bank? If you're gonna buy into a bank as far as a stock in the United States, who's at the top of the list? It's J.P. Morgan. To John Rockefeller, but Morgan was certainly the man everyone turned to when things got bad. In October 1907, Morgan summoned the great bankers of the day to his office at 23 Wall Street. With the collective capital of America's big banks, Morgan arranged for the rescue of the healthy banks that were nevertheless near bankruptcy due to irrational fears. Virtually the same thing would happen a century later in 2008 when the government bailed out the banks, but this time it was happening entirely thanks to private individuals like John Morgan. Once the panic was contained, it became clear to everyone that a central bank was necessary, and Congress immediately passed legislation to create one. However, that was pretty much the only thing everyone agreed on. The actual details of how it would work sparked long and fierce debates that halted any progress. The agricultural South, for example, was afraid that a powerful central bank would give Washington and Wall Street too much power over them. The bankers meanwhile wanted to make sure that the central bank would not be manipulated by political interests. They wanted it to be as independent as possible from Washington. The sheer number of competing parties made creating a central bank extremely difficult, and negotiations would in fact take over five years to finalize. What's interesting though is that these negotiations weren't happening on Capitol Hill. Instead, they were held 600 miles south of Washington on Jekyll Island in Georgia. That resort was home to an exclusive club of over 800 of the wealthiest men at the time, including John Morgan. Of course, only a select few would help draft the actual plan for the central bank, and it wouldn't be until 1913 that legislation would actually come to pass. The newly created Federal Reserve was truly a miracle of compromise. To accommodate all the various interests of the diverse United States, the Fed became a central bank unlike any other in the world. To begin with, it wasn't a single bank. Instead, it was a network of 12 regional banks, each governed by local bankers and businessmen. Some of these banks were in obvious places, like New York and Chicago, but many of the other locations came down to politics. The senator from Missouri, for example, was a key vote needed to pass legislation, which is why today Missouri is the only state to have two Federal Reserve banks within its borders. To appease Washington, these 12 regional banks would have a single governing body, comprised of seven people appointed by the president and confirmed by the president. And so these banks that they're mentioning right now, like, can they still exist today? And these are, the, like, again, this was not voted upon in Washington, stuff like for this idea to come about. This was done on Jekyll Island, which the average person does not have access to. This is the wealthiest people in America that had access to this island. And most recently, a bunch of these people that were in charge of these banks decided it was better off to quit their job than come under too much question about insider trading. And then like, and you can be like, oh, Smurf, you're just kind of, you know, you're just making that up. Well, shortly after that, it was about a month ago, maybe maybe two months ago now, that the Federal Reserve actually came out and now they made it so that they can't do insider trading for the first time in history. Over a hundred years after they were established. Now they can't do insider trading. So call it what you want, but why did they just now make a rule like that? The senator from Missouri, for example, was a key vote needed to pass legislation, which is why today Missouri is the only state to have two Federal Reserve banks within its borders. To appease Washington, these 12 regional banks would have a single governing body, comprised of seven people appointed by the president and confirmed by the Senate. To limit the president's power, he can only appoint one governor every two years with a 14-year term. But the really unique part of the Fed's structure, and you can thank John Morgan for that, is the fact that each regional bank is actually structured as a private corporation that has its own stock. Here's how it works. Every nationally chartered bank in America is required by law to keep 6% of its capital in its regional reserve bank. In exchange, that private bank receives an equivalent amount of shares in the regional reserve bank. These shares, however, are quite different from the shares of public companies. Their price is fixed at $100 per share and they can't be sold or traded. They carry voting rights to about two-thirds of the board of directors for that regional reserve bank, but as we know, the real power is in the board of governors appointed by the president. What these shares do have, however, is a fixed 6% dividend per year. Now it's worth noting that this dividend doesn't entitle the banks to any of the Fed's profits. Instead, everything the Fed earns above that 6% payout goes directly into the Treasury. And keep in mind, the Fed is very profitable. In 2017, it sent $80 billion to the Treasury while only paying out $14 billion to the regular banks that hold its stock. So who are the shareholders of the Federal Reserve? Well, basically every big bank in America. The full list is 150 pages long, but pretty much every name you know appears on it. But here's the beautiful thing. Most of America's big banks are public corporations. In other words, if you want to benefit and make money off of the unique structure of the Federal Reserve, you can do that by purchasing stock in American banks. Since ownership in the Fed depends on capital, the bigger the bank, the bigger its ownership stake. Therefore, it would be wisest to start from the top of the list. And speaking of the stock market, in case you somehow missed it, last month I released a 20-minute animated series of videos on how the stock market works on Skillshare. I cover topics like how dividends get paid out or how ETFs work, and if you want to watch the full class, you can register for a two-month free trial of Skillshare using the link in the description. Once you've registered, search for Investing 101 or follow the link I've left in the comments below. If you don't know, Skillshare is the best online learning platform out there. It has thousands of different classes on a wide variety of topics, including business and the stock market. By the way, I want to thank all 2,000 of you who already watched my class. You've helped to make it the most popular stock market class on Skillshare, and I'm thankful. In fact, I'm already working on a second series of videos that goes deeper into how companies work, including valuations, buybacks, multi-class stocks, and a whole bunch of other fascinating topics. I'll let you know when that course goes live, but until then, make sure you've checked out Skillshare and my one course on it. Anyway, thanks for watching. If you're new to Business Casual, make sure to subscribe and also consider liking this video if you enjoyed it. Again, this video is by Business Casual. Find them on YouTube. Yeah, yeah. you think like, I know I've heard some of this before but uh, yeah definitely it's always it's interesting and again my purpose of this is to share this with people because this helps you get a better knowledge of how to invest what you should be investing in what you should be looking out for how to understand things and you're probably not gonna understand everything at a more macro level if you don't even know that the Federal Reserve was basically created by JP Morgan 
and there's and like when you look at the structure of banks and like what's the strongest the biggest bank in america why is it jp morgan why is it so hard for jp morgan to go under why does jp morgan get all this special treatment <laughs> the more you know oh you might be muted uh, yeah i know it's 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 telling that the um, the one percent at that time has structured uh, what s some may define as systemic uh, structures to continue what m making as as much money as they are. Yeah, how they're able to become trust fund babies and stuff. Basically, if you're, cause, I mean, like, look, if your family is you know part of that banking structure early on chances are they're still wealthy uh, if your family like not only not only just because they've been making so much money but then what are the chances that your family you know you're part of one of these banks one of these uh, federal reserve banks and your family didn't teach you anything at all about buying shares of that bank because it'll basically pay, just continue to pay you and that's where the vast majority of the money in the united states goes to that's what's getting bailed out first they're not going to say anything to you about that? No, they're going to tell you. They're going to tell you. They're going to tell you. And everybody else, like most of them, don't know. And it's not being taught in schools. <laughs> so. Yeah, and, and things that pop up that we don't know. Like you were saying, the number of the CEOs have stepped down. Um, specifically, the number of CEOs that were stepping down right before the pandemic hit. As if they knew something was coming you had uh bill gates to take a step back what in december uh bob Iger, uh february 25th hulu linkedin mgm volkswagen mastercard like these aren't i mean these are people that are heavy in in the game and they understand what's what's coming and rather than them stay on they rather take a step back and keep all their money but i mean i'm i'm just putting things together but it's also not hard to like connect the dots on people on fucking elon became the richest man during the pandemic uh, Jeff, Jeff Bezos, what made double? It's an insane amount of money. <laughs> oh, you know, he just he made a lot of money. He does, yeah, yeah, yeah. And like, yeah, like you're saying, yeah, a lot of these, a lot of these uh, CEOs stepped down. And again, I was speaking toward um, just the CEO or presidents, not the CEO specifically, uh, but presidents of some of these Federal Reserve banks that like only stepped down after midway like because they only these these federal reserve presidents only stepped down after they started to get questioned about insider trading and after people started to call it insider trip which is what it was otherwise they wouldn't have you know taken that information that feedback and then a few months later going all right maybe the federal reserve should not be allowed to do insider trading and call it just that Mm, so then they were doing inside and the crazy thing is like you know you can be listening to these like oh insider trading whatever but no they that that's like have you ever seen the movie the wolf of lost street he jordan belfer got locked up for insider trading they've been locking people up for insider trading for a hundred plus years but the people at the top of the chain have been making the rules about it and doing it while locking up anybody else who's getting close to their level of wealth that's crazy. That's crazy. You gonna penalize somebody else for doing what you're doing? Wow. Wow. Yeah. So, thought that was an important put in here today. Again, my own opinions and stuff, but uh, you can also look up all this information. <sighs> the next video we have is called. And just diving into the topic a little bit more. This is called the secret meeting at Jekyll Island. I just figured, well, you know. Well, on November after, 22nd. After learning about this, 
you know, from, from previous videos that have mentioned it a bit and mentioned the Federal Reserve, maybe we'd want to dive in a little bit more and learn about Jekyll Island. And so this is from a YouTuber named Miss Professor Barth. Um, yeah, he's going to take us into a little bit more of the history on Jekyll Island. There's also a book by uh, a gentleman from the Gentleman of Crypto YouTube channel that I like. Uh, I have a pretty big uh, Bitcoiner. Um, I want to say it's Isaiah Thomas, even though I, that's obviously the basketballer's name. I'm like, am I getting the first name wrong? I don't know. I'm pretty sure that's right. Uh, but big Bitcoiner. And um, you know, he has a book called uh, The Monster on Jekyll Island. And uh, it's also covering this topic because, you know, again, like a lot of people find, feel like, not just me, but a lot of people feel like not knowing these things is only going to hinder your investing strategies and what you're researching for macro economics. Anything from you before you jump into this video? Uh, I'm sh I'm sure many people are already starting to see that um, like crypto is not just a bunch of privileged people in a in a room just deciding how things will go. Yeah, and then everybody has to go by that, and that becomes the world order because all the other countries in the world also go. Yeah, that's wild, y'all. <laughs> just, I, just the one yeah. percent that have nothing to do with the democracy itself necessarily but they'll work their way in there with their influence from being the one percent and yeah. the rest of us will just abide by that because we never know about it and don't ask any questions about it kind of makes they you think democracy it. is an illusion to an extent to an extent yeah i mean like it's just like that the wealthy obviously have their hand in the pot and can influence things. If they were able to influence our current banking system and tax system, then obviously they have more influence than, than people are giving them credit for. And there's a reason probably why that's not being taught in school. Otherwise, like some of this knowledge would have been taught in school and it's literally never mentioned. It's because they don't know. I mean, the wealthy know, the wealthy know, but... but not the school teachers. Oh yeah, the school the teachers principal. don't know. They don't know. They don't know. They don't know. Yeah. There's another video that I want to do eventually uh, in this series that kind of covers that exact topic from a guy who was doing a lot of uh, research. His job is to do research on different topics and like make documentaries and stuff. And he was doing research on accountants um, and people that are in the financial field. And what he found is that, like kind of like you're saying, a lot of accountants did not know any of this information. They were just taught, you know, go to school, become accounting. This is a tax system. This and that. And so it's like you're being indoctrinated. You know, you're being kind of brainwashed to a certain type of thing. You don't ask questions. You this is just how things are. This is what you need to know. This is how you get good grades. And they get good grades, and they don't ask questions, and they don't know anything else. But yeah. In this next video, the secret meeting of Jekyll Island and the Aldrich Pan plan, excuse me, by Professor Barth. Well, on November 22nd, 1910, Nelson Aldrich and a group of top financiers in the United States went off in seclusion and in secrecy to a small island off the coast of Georgia called Jekyll Island. Jekyll Island. At Jekyll Island, there is a club, Jekyll Island Club. The co-owner of the club was none other than J.P. Morgan. In fact, J.P. Morgan uh, arranged for um, this facility to be used at the meeting. The Rockefellers and Vanderbilts were also members of the Jekyll Island Club. And here were the attendees. Now, you see Aldrich there. And if you watch some of our previous videos, you will recognize a few of these faces. There's Benjamin Strong. There's Paul Warburg. There's Henry Davison. There's Frank Vanderlip. Who are these men? Well, <laughs> filled with Morgan and Rockefeller financiers. There's Henry Davison, senior partner at J.P. Morgan & Company. Charles E. Norton at the First National Bank of New York, which was in the Morgan orbit. Benjamin Strong, who we talked about in previous lecture. Bankers Trust in New York. He was a partner of J.P. Morgan. Paul Warburg, who we also discussed, represented Kuhn Loeb. Currently director of Wells Fargo, Frank Vanderlip was the uh, uh, CEO of National City Bank of New York, which today is Citibank. That was Rockefeller dominated. Nelson Aldrich, well, father in law to John D. Rockefeller Jr., Republican and head of the National uh, Monetary Commission, and then a university economist. Uh, All together, these seven men represented one quarter, one quarter of the world's wealth. So just highly, highly, highly concentrated amount of power and wealth meeting at this island. And the meeting happened in total secrecy, so much that it's a bit amusing to, to read about. Um, this was an age of muckraking journalism. And Nelson Aldrich was terrified that the press might get wind of this meeting. Because if the press found out about who was at this meeting, Jekyll Island, and what they were doing hammering up plan for a central bank, there was no way in this era of trust busting and skepticism of the money power, there was no way that Aldrich's plan would ever succeed in a court of public opinion. And so Aldrich had to keep it very hush-hush. And so the uh, official cover story was, oh, it's a duck hunting expedition. 
and uh, the, the the attendees took just super super elaborate pr precautions on the trip there and back they all they boarded a train at hoboken new jersey heading uh, down south as a private railroad car in the cover of darkness they used code names uh, on, on the train um took just again extra precautions to make sure reporters weren't available weren't around so that they might be able to preserve their secrecy they ended up staying there 10 years and hammered out their, or uh, 10 days excuse me 10 days and hammered out their plan by the way uh in november of 2010 the federal reserve held a 100 year anniversary conference at jekyll island georgia six years after the jekyll island meeting the founder of forbes magazine one of the greatest business magazines in the world the founder bc forbes was one of the first reporters to detail the jekyll island meeting including how the attendees got there and he, he gave everything i just described detail he looked into it he described it as the quote strangest most secret expedition in the history of american finance the real birth of the present federal reserve system Bertie charles forbes 1916 and, and he was right it was a uh, very strange very secret expedition i think sometimes when people first hear the Jekyll Island story, it just sounds so conspiratorial, and, and there's a reluctance to maybe believe it because it's, it sounds like it's from a novel, but uh, it, it happened. <laughs> it happened. It's a verifiable fact, uh, all the details I just described, and, and it was verified later also by the attendees. Sometimes truth is stranger than fiction, and you can understand why they wanted secrecy. The fact of the matter is, if the public had gotten wind of who was there, the Aldrich plan wouldn't have stood a chance. And uh, and so, you know, if you if you wanted to achieve the, um, the establishment of a central bank, you needed some secrecy. And, um, a bit later, Frank Vanderlip reflected on Jekyll Island and had this to say, I enjoyed it as much as I've ever enjoyed anything else. I lived during those days on Jekyll Island at the highest picture of intellectual awareness that I've ever experienced. It was thrilling. Frank A. Vanderlip, CEO of Citibank. Well, Aldrich um, leaves Jekyll Island and he has his plan now ready. And in January of 1911, a few weeks later, the National Monetary Commission releases their long awaited report. And the report says, quote, we have no provision for the concentration of the cash reserves of the banks and for their mobilization and use wherever needed in times of trouble. Experience has shown that the scattered cash reserves of our banks are inadequate for purposes of assistance or defense at such times. What's, what does that mean in layman's uh, terms or English? Uh, we need a lender of last resort. We need some sort of institution to, to mobilize these reserves and resources in times of panic. The system, in short, is way too decentralized. Our banks also lack adequate means available for use at any time to replenish their reserves or increase their loaning powers when necessary to meet normal or unusual demands. So that's the problem, according to Aldrich and the National Monetary Commission. What's the solution? This is the solution. They say what we need is a National Reserve Association, a National Reserve Association that would oversee regional reserve centers. And those regional reserve centers would be all throughout the country. And they would oversee the banking system. They would uh, uh, print a single paper currency and act as a lender of last resort. Aldrich said this about his plan. It is not a bank, but a cooperative union of all the banks of the country. And so Aldrich submitted his plan for National Reserve Association to Congress. This is a bill essentially for a banker-run central bank. All of the officials of the National Reserve Association were to be uh, uh, appointed by banking executives. Okay, No government appointees at all. This is a banker-run central bank called the National Reserve Association. Um, Aldrich was very careful to avoid the, the uh, uh, to, to avoid calling it a central bank, as you saw on the previous slide. This is not a bank, uh, but a cooperative union of the banks. Um, because that, that word central bank, many people still felt very uneasy about it in the United States. And nonetheless, lender of last resort, a single paper currency run by the banking industry. That is the Aldrich plan. William Howard Taft, the Republican president, comes out and supports the plan, urges Congress to pass the Aldrich plan. The American Bankers Association also endorses Aldrich's plan. But something bad had happened for Aldrich in November 1910, just prior to the meeting at Jekyll Island. Democrats won the congressional elections, right? It wasn't a presidential election, it was the, the by-election, or excuse me, the uh, congressional election, 1910. Democrats took over the House, and this stalls Aldrich's plan. Aldrich is a Republican. I should also say, I just want to say, because it, it keeps popping up in the, the numbers, of this, of, you know, last few videos at this point now. Uh, but 1913, what else happened in 1913, folks? The IRS was created. Um, so the current taxing system, the people complain, oh, tax the rich and this and that, or why do the rich, you know, the rich are able to avoid taxes and blah, 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 blah. It's because they actually know the game. They actually know the game. And they created the game. And so, like, <laughs> it's, you, it's, you need to put the pieces of the puzzle together. They, it wasn't they were catching up to the game or, oh, it was created in 1700 or 18. That's not true. It was created in 1913. And that's why they know what they know. And now his plan, the, the Democrats don't like it. Because from the Democrats' perspective, this is just nakedly pro-banker, right? This is a pro-banker plan. Now, they didn't know about the Jekyll Island stuff, but you didn't need to know about Jekyll Island to, to look at this plan and see that, you know, if you're alarmed about the money trust, that this isn't, uh, this is not an adequate solution. And so Aldrich's plan is stalled and, and he wasn't even able to introduce the bill until January, 1912. And in an uh, interval, he's lobbying and trying to, to, to get the votes necessary in order for the plan to, to pass, but uh, it does not succeed. This is a, an anti-Aldrich plan cartoon of the time, the coming money trust, the coming money trust. Boy, if you thought you had a money trust like before, great just wait. Uh, this National Reserve Association that Aldrich has, has uh, devised is going to, uh, is going to make the, the current money trust pale in comparison to this National Reserve Association private syndicate, the octopus, Aldrich plan. And what's he doing? He's, he's got the whole system of government, the White House, the Treasury, the U.S. Capitol, the bank, the factories, the, the you know, just the ordinary home. And he's just looting the whole country and pouring all this money into what? The New York Stock Exchange, Wall Street. This is the Wall Street plan. And in fact, a Republican, a member of the House of Representatives, Charles Lindbergh, who represented Minnesota. Um, this is not the Charles Lindbergh who, who uh, flew across the Atlantic in, in 1927. That was his son. This is Charles 
Lindbergh Sr., Republican from Minnesota, and Charles Lindbergh raised the alarm about this bill. He said, quote, the Aldrich plan is the Wall Street plan. It means another panic, if necessary, to intimidate the people. Aldrich, paid by the government to represent the people, proposes a plan for the trust instead. Charles Lindbergh uses his position in Congress and his influence in Congress to call for a probe of the money trust. And in 1912, the Democrats in the House, led by the uh, committee, the House Committee, or the chair of the House Committee on Banking and Currency, his name is Arson Pujo, he's a Democrat from Louisiana, convened a special committee to investigate J.P. Morgan and the money trust more generally. Um, this committee concluded that J.P. Morgan um, had secured a de facto monopoly of the New York banking system, and that there was indeed a money power, that there was indeed a money trust. Um, Morgan was called in, um, scrutinized by this committee, um, many uh, famous exchanges between the committee and Morgan uh, uh, during this investigation. And the investigation concluded, after looking into things, they found that the officers at J.P. Morgan and Company also happened to sit on a board of directors at 112 corporations. Think about that. The officers at J.P. Morgan Company also sat on a board of directors of 112 corporations whose market capitalization amounted to $22.5 billion, $22.5 billion. And this was in an age where the total capitalization of the New York Stock Exchange was $26.5 billion. So in short, they found that, that, that there is a money power, there is a money trust, and Morgan in particular is uh, the most dominant power in this. This was a, uh, a magazine cover critical of Morgan's control over Wall Street, over big finance. But the Bujo Report didn't just pick on Morgan. They also singled out Benjamin Strong, who was one of Morgan's biggest partners. They also singled out Jacob Schiff and Paul Warburg. All of these men, they said, have created a system that uh, doesn't work for the good of the public, but works for the benefit of an oligarchical view. Now, Morgan, uh, when he was testifying before the committee, was in ill health. He actually uh, passed away on March 3rd. Hmm, Schiff. Where have we heard the last name Schiff before? Could that be another 1% Peter Schiff's father? <laughs> 31st, 1913. So Morgan uh, only lived so long. And actually his uh, his, his uh, friends blamed the Pujo committee, uh, the, the intensive hearings as uh, responsible perhaps for Morgan's death in 1913. This is a Democrat cartoon that says Dem House going after the satanic money trust. The satanic money trust chasing them around the, the stump of politics. Democrats defeated the Aldrich plan in 1912. Democrats defeated the Aldrich plan in 1912. Oh, must be over. That's all right. Well, no, that's not all. That's not all. Aldrich plan failed, but the basic skeleton will not. There's a presidential election in 1912. The Democrats run Woodrow Wilson. Now, Wilson just so happened to be good friends with Frank Vanderlip of Citibank, and their friendship went back many years. In fact, Wilson had friendships throughout much of Wall Street. Now, Wilson, a Democrat, campaigned against the Aldrich plan, but he didn't really give uh, much of an alternative to, to what he would like to see instead. Wilson said this during the campaign. Um, Any institutions arriving from banking reform must be, quote, public, not private. It must be vested in the government itself so that the banks must be the instruments, not the masters of business. But, you know, what does that even mean exactly? He didn't, he didn't give any precise details. Um, the Democratic platform in 1912, the official party platform, said this. We oppose the so-called Aldrich Bill of the establishment of the central bank. We believe the people of the country will be largely freed from panics by such a systematic revision of our banking laws as will render temporary relief in localities where such relief is needed with protection from control or domination by what is known as the money trust. So they said what we need is an institution that is not controlled or dominated by the money trust. That's the solution, okay? We oppose the Aldrich Bill. We oppose this, this idea for a central bank run by bankers. The platform continued. Banks exist for the accommodation of the public and not for the control of business. All legislation on the subject of banking and currency should have for its purpose the securing of these accommodations on terms of absolute security to the public and the complete protection from the misuse of the power that wealth gives to those who possess it. That's a Democratic platform. Uh, short on details. Short on details. Well, Wilson wins this election. He becomes president in March of 1913. Over the summer, negotiations take place in the House and in the Senate into the fall. There's the electoral map, by the way. Quite a victory for Wilson. Quite a victory for Wilson. Taft had competition there from Teddy Roosevelt. And on December 23rd, 1913, Woodrow Wilson signed into law the Federal Reserve Act, and we will take a look at that in the next part of our video. See you there. All right. Da -da -da -da. Hello. Pause that. Yeah, and so uh, just want to go quick Google search. Yeah, that was uh, the the shift that they mentioned is uh, I do believe uh, the. Uh, Related to the Peter Schiff that we now know in the media as a top 1% there in the United States who is very pro gold and anything that preserves his wealth um, and makes it very, you know, is very vocal about being one of America's 1%. Again, any takeaways from you there in that last video? Oh, you're muted. It reminds me of an article from Edward Snowden back in, what was this, uh, it's either 2020 or 2021, about how uh, people are so concerned about conspiracy theories that they ignore conspiracy practices. Bonds are a mm. uh, Such as, just real quick, um, 
the method by which bonds are a common investment. However, true many invest conspiracies such as so gerrymandering or the debt industry or mass surveillance are realized are almost always overshadowed by conspiracy theories. Those malevolent falsehoods that can erode civic confidence in the existence of anything certain or verifiable. Hmm. So it's um, it's a rem um, a reminder that the the majority of these conspiracies are happening in front of you, but you would rather believe that there's a underground sex uh, <laughs> ring. Yeah, yeah the Illuminati is out for sex and this and that, and it's like these things are happening and they're based on something, but. Yeah, it's not the sex dungeon and this and that type of thing. You know, it's more like shit like this Jekyll Island stuff that most people don't want to... Oh, why would that be what it is? To, to maintain order. I don't like give a about sex. You, sure, they can have sex at the house anytime they want. And it's, it's really not an issue. <laughs> right. What it's is an right, issue it, it, is... <laughs> Go ahead. It's right there. It's happening in front of you and it's Public not... Public information. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's crazy. It's crazy. Um, but yeah, I mean, a lot of this information I didn't know, uh, and didn't start to know until a few years ago. Like I had already began my, my, my journey into cryptocurrency and learning about things. And one thing about uh, learning about crypto and investing is that because I already had my interest in stocks and that didn't quite peak everything to this degree. But once you start to learn about crypto, which is like trying to fix certain other things and people are talking about fixing things, and you're like, well, what's wrong with stocks and what's wrong with the current mark what's wrong with banking what's wrong why would we want to do that and it's just the fact that that question is asked instead of you just assuming that it's all fine that it's been around for forever like uh, i mentioned the other episode but uh, i had a conversation with my father a few months ago uh or maybe it was last year it's like it's like a few months ago but anyways uh i was talking about the united states dollar and the current monetary policy i think because i think it's around the beginning of the pandemic and i was like uh yeah, I feel like the dollar is about run its course, like as far as being like the world reserve currency and being like this this major player. Like I'm sure, like I think I think it'll still have its place or whatever. But I think it's time and the sun as of everybody just being like it's the and all be all currency. It's like about run its course and like by on average, I forget if it's like it's like fifty to seventy five years something like that is like the lifespan of a currency typically around fifty seventy five years or so, and so by averages. It's run its course. I'm like, I'm like, and, and right about, right about on time too, because uh, the current dollar came around. I want to say it's either like in the fifties or seventies or something like that, somewhere around that time period. Somewhere give or take, twenty years or so, without having the exact, you know, I'm not being quiz, so without having the exact date. It's, um, you know, you take, but if you go from the fifties to, to currently, that's about about seventy five years. If you go from the seventies to about fifty years, so it's right about in that time, and the dollar is facing some serious turmoil. And if you just Google the average lifespan of a currency, it's about hitting that mark. And I was bringing that up with my father, and he was like, "Oh, the United States current monetary you know policy has you know the, the dollar has been around for hundreds of years." He's like, "No, it's not that young. It's hundreds of years old." And I'm like, "No, that to, for it to be hundreds of years old, you would have to uh, you know put away the concept of the greenback." put away the concept of the gold standard. You would not have to buy, but because that's what the dollar used to represent. It used to represent greenbacks. It used to represent the, the gold standard where you could actually take a dollar and get gold for it from the bank. Um, and both of those things no longer exist for what the dollar was. You know, it's like, so like, no, the dollar, like, and then those ones, have, they've gone to zero. <laughs> and so it's like, no, the, 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 those concepts of the dollar no longer exist. We are on a new monetary policy that is only so old. Um, but you have to know that. And, and I'm also not surprising. He was a banker. He was a banker. And so that goes right along with the idea that, like, even though, like, you know, a lot of these people, like, they're not going to ask those questions. They're going to ask questions to figure out the current situation. But, like, is that all there is? Eh. And then convincing somebody who's like, oh, well, that's all I know. And I'm in this circle of group think is a whole nother level of it. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, anything from you before we play these last videos? No. Oh, oh, cool, good. cool. 
uh yeah this next one um i feel like the most exciting stuff was probably uh the earlier portions because you know you get you get to learn about the federal reserve and jack lyle and stuff like that it's got a little conspiracy in there uh but well it feels like a little conspiracy because there were conspiracies to a degree but they were true <laughs> public information you could actually you yeah. can all that information if you any of it anybody listening you're like oh that sounds like far-fetched Google it or go to the library even and find a book because it's all there. It's all public information. You're not spouting out anything that hasn't been well documented. So there's that information for you. Uh, this next video that we're going to play is talking about bonds. And so this is just investing basics of bonds. And this is by another video by TD Amitrite. Um, yeah, so it's just to give us a quick uh, summary of what bonds are because I feel like oftentimes, you know, you hear the term bonds, uh, you also hear the term bonds in cryptocurrency, uh, different projects trying because again, crypto is trying to fix everything in DeFi, um, trying to fix a lot of the other things or make similar systems to it. Um, and they get they get dragged to the mud when they fail and stuff like that. But tons of American banks have failed in the past, and like there's been runs in the banks, and tons of our other currencies have failed in the past. And so to to look at new technology as like oh it's horrible because if it look well what about the other some hundred years of American history where the exact same thing ha- happened and then we get some type of structure that works. Meanwhile, Bitcoin is still working. So um, you know just just take people's when they say stuff like that with a grain of salt and like do your own research is kind of my my advice to that point. Uh, but enough for me rambling on. This video is about investing basics on bonds because I feel like not everybody has an education on bonds. Bonds are a common investment. However, to many investors, they remain a mystery. So let's explore what a bond is and how it might benefit your investment portfolio. A bond is simply a loan given to a company or government by an investor. By issuing a bond, a company or government borrows money from investors, who in return are paid interest on the money they've loaned. Companies and governments issue bonds frequently to fund new projects or ongoing expenses. Some investors use bonds in hopes of preserving the money they have while also generating additional income. Bonds are often viewed as a less risky alternative to stocks and are sometimes used to diversify a portfolio. Consider this example. The city of Fairview wants to build a new baseball stadium, so it decides to issue bonds to raise money. Each bond is a loan for $1,000, which Fairview promises to pay back in 10 years. To make this loan more attractive to investors, Fairview agrees to pay an annual interest rate of 5%, which in the bond world is also known as a coupon rate. An investor buys the bond face value for $1,000. Now, let's fast forward. Each year, the city of Fairview pays the investor $50. These regular interest rates continue for the length of the bond, which is 10 years. Once the bond reaches maturity, the investor redeems his bond, and Fairview returns his $1,000 principal investment. This bond was a good deal for both the city and our investor. Fairview got the money it needed to build the stadium. The investor received regular interest payments and return of the original investment. Because a bond offers regularly scheduled payments and return of invested principal, bonds are often viewed as a more predictable and stable form of investing. Compare regular payments of a bond to the experience of owning a stock. With stocks, profits and losses are driven by market forces and are generally less predictable. Of course, like any investment, bonds are not without risk. One risk that bond investors face is the possibility that the issuer defaults on paying back the principal. This is what is known as default risk. Typically, bonds with higher default risk also come with higher coupon rates. The amount of risk depends mostly on the financial stability of the issuer. For example, most governments are generally considered stable issuers and issue bonds with a relatively low coupon rate. Corporate bonds typically represent a greater risk of default, as companies can and do go bankrupt. That's why corporate bonds often offer a higher coupon rate. Several credit rating agencies assign rankings to different bonds. This can help bond investors to gauge the financial strength of the bond issuer. These ratings agencies often use different criteria for measuring risk, so it's a good idea to compare ratings when considering a particular bond. And keep in mind, rating agencies aren't always accurate, so be sure to research a bond and its risks thoroughly before investing. Another risk to consider is interest rate risk. This is the risk that interest rates will go up, and any bonds you own will be worth less if sold before the maturity date. After all, when interest rates rise, more investors allocate their money to the new, higher interest rate bonds. If you wanted to unload a low interest rate bond to take advantage of these new rates, you would have to sell your bond at a discount to make it a worthwhile purchase for another investor. Capital preservation and income generation are just two ways bonds might be part of a diversified portfolio. Many investors use a mix of stocks and bonds to pursue their investment goals. And because bonds move differently from stocks, they can help increase or protect portfolio returns. Keep in mind that this discussion shows you one simplified way that investors might use bonds, and only a few of the risks to consider. Like all investments, bonds are complex and have a variety of uses and risks. Before you invest in bonds, it's important that you invest in your own financial education. All right, so quick um, and to the point. And uh, also to note there that, yeah, the Federal Reserve has been increasing interest rates. And that's what a lot of people are concerned about. Not only has inflation been going up and at a high. Um, also, I'll speak about inflation just briefly. One of the reasons that got me into cryptocurrency to begin with and to start looking at stocks before cryptocurrency to begin with was just realizing that um, there was this thing called inflation that people were not talking about necessarily, like especially not back in like, you know, I started taking interest around, I don't know, I want to say 2010, 2013. It's like that area. I started really doing a lot of research around it. And uh, nobody's really talking about it then, but I started to learn that, you know, the average inflation, even back then, was around 2.5, 2.8% for average inflation. And jobs, on average, were only, if, if somebody did get a pay raise, was around 28 to 3% pay raise per year. And so per year, you are more likely to be losing money because um, most people are not getting that pay raise every single year. Uh, and especially, like, and that's for men, Honestly, if you're a woman, you're that much less likely, like on average, to like speak up about it, you know, Cause like typically, you know, don't want to be like spoken, like speak out of the office or whatever and say something if they're in one of those positions. And 
that leads to, yeah, you do it that much worse for you then because it's going to be how many years? Three, four, five years before maybe she said something or the, the, the job just goes, here, here's a pay raise. And most people be happy after that three or four or five years of getting that pay raise. But that's 2.5 to 2.8% times five. And then you get a 3% pay raise. You're losing money. You're losing money. And the bank's not supporting with their 0.02% or whatever the heck on on how much you get like a year. It's not being supported. You're just losing money by having cash. And that's what really spurred me to look into this, some of this stuff. But yeah, I kind of went off on that tangent initially because uh, I just wanted to mention the Federal Reserve. They said one of the issues with bonds, because bonds do have their issues, is that if interest rates start to rise, if the Federal Reserve starts to rise interest rates, then you know your bond is going to start, you're going to earn less. And the Federal Reserve has been raising interest rates. And so, and they've done it multiple times already this year. And the, the thought is that they will continue to raise interest rates every few months throughout 2022, which will make that less and less and less and less. And then what are people going to do with these bonds? Are they going to keep, keep holding on to them? Or are they going to sell them and try to get a better price? What are they going to do with them? Um, so, yeah, well, that's why I wanted to conclude that one because all that's wrapped in with the Federal Reserve and then also just this concept of bonds, which otherwise, you know, if it's going fine, it's another nice investment vehicle. And maybe that's just a better vehicle in general. Like, But it's nice to know about these things. If you don't even know what they do, then what are the chances that you ever consider buying bonds? There was a point in American history where people would stand out on the corners and wave signs around and say, buy bonds. They don't do that anymore. If you if you guys want a quick, uh, not quick, but an in, enjoyable uh, download of the whole well not the whole but just of the the housing bubble and the whole grading i know they're not i know they were giving grades to loans and we're talking about bonds but it can be applied just watch the big short mm. yeah, beautiful yeah. movie yeah that's a good one yeah i like all the little investing like that uh wall street honestly like it's it's a lot more silly uh, but the Wolf of Wall Street, even to get like an idea of like, because the things, the concepts they bring up in Wolf of Wall Street, again, that's like part of what, what got me interested in all the other ones and stuff like that. Even things like Boiler Room, whatever, um, Glenn Gary, uh, Glenn Roth, uh, was it the penny stocks? And like, how do you, how does this person go from not earning anything to becoming uh, a broker on Wall Street to earning more than the average broker on Wall Street? And it was the level of investing that he started to, to learn about. But our last video of the day uh, is about the stock market. And so this is actually a Netflix video. What? Yeah, it's a Netflix video. Um, it doesn't go crazy in depth about the stock stock market and stocks. I wanted to cover some things like, you know, shares and the fact that shares can be diluted by these companies if they want, like basically, and I'll just mention that ahead of time because they don't mention this in the video. Basically, once stocks are issued or those shares are issued to people, uh, what the company can also do then is dilute those shares. And so after they've made so much profit, let's say every stock is worth $100. And people don't know that this happens very often. And it's not mentioned in this video. So I wanted to make sure I mentioned this. And you can do your own research and, and double check that. Double cross it and reference that. But let's say every stock, and this was an issue with GME, uh, when GME went up so much and their, their current CEO actually listened to the apes on Reddit and stuff like that and did not dilute theirs. It was like one of the first times that like CEO listened to the masses. Um, but let's say every stock is worth one hundred dollars, and the company's made you know they're making they made two billion dollars because all their you know their stock raised up to now a worth of one hundred dollars per per stock. What companies do is they take that money they they earn that they you know they, they've been making money off of it, and how do they continue to make money though? Like they they will sell their stocks, make some money, and then like. Uh, They'll issue more stocks. They'll create kind of print out like kind of like the say way the United States prints out more dollars. They'll just print out more stocks. So you're still holding those stocks, and now they filled their bags up with more stocks. And there's just there's just more stocks. It's just they just increase the supply, um, and that's what they call it, diluting stocks um, without being too technical about it. But pretty much how it happens. Um, so they just they just increase the supply of stocks, and like with anything else, like if you haven't noticed, United States dollar. What happened when we printed out? 80% of all United States dollars in the last few years. Inflation, inflation. Um, currently the United States dollar is actually at a, at a strong 
it's at its strongest peak um, in the last, like, I want to say eight to 10 years, something like that, actually, on USD index. Uh, however, we're facing very strong inflation, and the only thing that's pushing it up to that amount is the fact that the Federal Reserve is doing these interest rate hikes to try to adjust things. So it's bad for certain investments, but good for the strength of the dollar. Um, but generally speaking, uh, my initial point with this is just that, like, if you had a stock and they printed out more of it, um, those people at the company are going to make sure they get their money's worth. And they're going to print out more stocks so they can sell more to people. So the idea is to not to hurt people necessarily. It's to, to make sure they can keep making money um, and get it out to more investors' hands. But those investors individually would probably be happier if the stock stayed at the same amount of stocks. And more, if somebody wanted to get in, they had to pay that investor individually more money, not pay the company more money or less money to get in on that stock, uh, because all that does is dilute the investor's uh, amount. Like, so if it was worth a hundred dollars, now it's going to be worth like ninety bucks, and it gives it a little bit more spread, a little bit more room to push back up. But it, it makes it uh, a better entry point for new investors. Um, so that is something else that happens in stocks, which they do not cover in this video. So I wanted to mention that as well. Uh, yeah, anything from you, uh, Space, before we jump into this, our last oh, video um, today? Um, let's make it happen, Captain. 